Okay, we're going to get started. Let me start this one too. Let's see. All right. So tonight we are going to start chapter eight, chapter eight of the book of Daniel. Uh, so we've come a long way. We are already past the halfway mark. I told you there are only twelve chapters. In the book of Daniel, we have cross chapter 6, and so we are now in the second half, and I told you in the second half of the book of Daniel, we're going to see a lot more prophecy about the end. Well, uh, last week, and for three lessons, we studied chapter 7, so let's do a little review. Uh, in chapter 7, just quickly, we started off talking about these four beasts, and we realized and found out that the four beasts represented was a, a representation of what we saw in chapter 2. It was just in a different format. And in chapter 2 we saw Nebuchadnezzar statue. Remember that? The, the head of gold represented Babylon. The silver represented Medo-Persia. The bronze represented Greece. Uh, Alexander the Great. And the um, what's that? The, was the iron. The iron the legs, the eyes of the legs, represented Rome, and then the ten toes, which, which was mixed with iron and clay, was the revived Roman Empire, and the ten representing the ten leaders. Now, in chapter 7, which we studied for three weeks, we saw uh, Daniel had another vision, and God showed him four beasts. And we found out that the four beasts was another representation of what we saw in chapter 2. The first beast was... Babylon, a representation of Babylon. The second beast was Medo-Persia. The third beast was Greece, which is Alexander the Great. And the fourth beast was a combination of the Roman Empire and the revived Roman Empire because he had teeth of iron and things like that. So we said that and we understood what all of that was. Now, what I love about Daniel, because he's going to go a little further, and I'm kind of a little ex excited about chapter 8 because I'm going to say some things that is going to make the Bible so amazing and why we believe the Bible. And I'm seeing if you can catch it as we go through chapter 8. We might not get through chapter 8, that's okay, because we're going to take our time um, with chapter 8 because you need to understand this. So uh, I thank God that he has given us these different examples like chapter 2 and chapter 7 of the same thing. Guess what he's going to do in chapter 8? He's going to do the same thing again. But he's going to give you different characters but he's going to give you different characters again explaining the same kingdoms which is Babylon. Always remember these names. Just write them down for yourself. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome, and then the revived Roman Empire. Uh, that's five. That's five. Really, it was seven, if I can remember the first great kingdom before Nebuchadnezzar. I think Egypt was first, and then who was second? The Second World Empire. We studied it in Revelation because uh, he talked about the seven horns. And that represented all of the kingdoms that would ever be great. If you ever get a chance to look that up for me. I know Egypt was the first who came after Egypt as a world power. But after Egypt, then came Nebuchadnezzar. Because he is starting with him. So I just don't remember the second one. But you probably find that in uh, Revelation when we talk about the seven horns. And I, I gave you Assyria. I think that's what it is. Assyria. So... When you look at it overall, in history, and this is how the world history is going to go, this is world history, there will be seven world, empire, world empires, and we call them the seven wonders of the world, seven world empires. The first world empire was Egypt, the second world empire was Assyria, the third world empire was Nebuchadnezzar, which is Babylon. The fourth world empire was Medo-Persia. The fifth world empire was Greece, which is Alexander the Great. The sixth world empire was Rome. The seventh world empire is the revived Roman 
Empire. And then there's one more coming after that that's going to be ran by man, which will be an eighth uh, empire, and that will be who? The Antichrist. The Antichrist will be the eighth. That's that's all human that's all of human history from the beginning till the end of man history or the times of the Gentiles. Now, after the eighth world empire, which the, which is the Antichrist empire, which he's going to take over the the uh, seventh empire, which is the revived Roman Empire. There's one more kingdom coming. It will be the ninth, and but it will last forever, and that's Christ's uh, kingdom. And his kingdom will never be destroyed. His kingdom will never go away. So just remember that. That's how world history is going to go. You can look at world history that way. And what, what I'm so excited about chapter 8 is, chapter 8, now just want you to know, Daniel was written before all of this happened. Daniel, the book of Daniel was written when? In the time of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. So how could Daniel predict Medo-Persia? They haven't happened yet. How could Daniel predict Rome and all of the and Alexander the Great? Here, this is three, four hundred years after him that these things happen. But what I want to show you in chapter eight, because they're going to go in great detail in chapter eight about these four kingdoms and what they would do, they are going to happen. Uh, as exactly as the Bible says. So for anybody to tell you that the Bible is not true, you're going to find out tonight that uh, it is true based on human history that the Bible is true and that this was prophesied 300 to 400 years before these events happened, which should give you some kind of relief and hope that if God was right in the book of Daniel, don't you think he right in the book of Revelation? If he was right in the book of Daniel, I mean precise in the book of Daniel about human history, then don't we think that Jesus was right and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when he was here and told us all these things that would happen in Matthew 24 about the end of the world and about he is the Christ. So we have to understand these are scriptures that you can use for, to anybody that tried to say that the Bible was just written by man and uh, to control us. That's what some people would tell you. The Bible was not to be trusted. And you say, yes, the Bible is to be trusted because it prophesied future events way before these events happened. And you don't even have to go to Revelation because Revelation, a lot of Revelation hasn't happened yet. So people can speculate about Revelation to you. Oh, that's not going to happen. He's not coming back. But then what about the book of Daniel? Where he prophesied human history and it already happened. And we're going to deal with that tonight. So, at the first part of, uh, on page one, uh, you don't have to read that first part. We're going to start where it says, verse one, the time, two years later. That's where we're going to start. So, let's read, um, and we're not going to read the entire chapter together because um, it's 27 verses. So, let's do this. Let's read the first 10 verses, and then we'll go back. So, I'll be reading from the new King James Version starting at verse 1 through 10 and it says in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar a vision appeared to me to me Daniel after the one that appeared to me the first time I saw in the vision and it was and it so happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan the citadel which is in the province of Elam and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulea. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up first. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes, like a unicorn. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. 
And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against them, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward uh, came up toward the four winds of heaven, and out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. In verse ten, and it grew up to the host of heaven, and it came down, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground, and trampled them. So you probably like, what in the world? is going on. <laughs> so, let's start in verse 1. Looking at your outline, verse 1, the time, two years later. Verse 1 again, in the in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I want you to understand right now that Daniel is not going in chronological order. So you're going to see, uh, that's why it says the time of Belshazzar. We know that Belshazzar is what? He's already dead. So Daniel is now going back to visions that he had when he was alive. So that just want, just want, to, want you to remember that. So he's going back to the time he received that vision. Uh, he also says, and let's look at verse 2, the place. Uh, Shushan and Elam near the river. In verse 2 it says this, I saw, the, I saw in the vision... And it so happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulea. Now, who, whoever has the King James Version, what does the citadel say? Temple in your version? What does it say? Does it say citadel in the King James Version too? No. What does it say in King James? Uh, Verse 2. And, and I saw in a vision. So, uh, yeah, that citadel in the New King James Version is palace. So when he was talking about it, he was near this palace near Shushan. Now, watch what he says. Now, uh, look at your outline. It is also important to set the background to this vision in that the temple does not exist at the time of the vision. So there is no temple at the time of the vision that Daniel was having. Because remember, Daniel is still captive. Where? Now he's under... The, of uh, not Darius or Cyrus, one of the two who's ruling uh, at this time. So that's where he is because you know uh, uh, Babylon is gone. Nebuchadnezzar is already dead, so he's still in, uh, in captive. So there's no temple, but he says, and notice what the Alma says. But the future rebuilt temple is central to this vision. This is similar to today where many prophecies point to a temple to be in existence where sacrifices occur, but is not in existence yet. And you can read those at home. Uh, remember, there is no temple in Jerusalem just for the Jews right now to sacrifice their animals for the forgiveness of their sins like they did in the Old Testament. They don't do that right now. But they are planning on doing it now. They are actually talking about rebuilding a temple. We know a temple has to be rebuilt because the Antichrist is going to walk in that temple in the tribulation days and do what? He's going to say he's God. He's going to commit the abomination of desolation. But just to show you, we're going to get to it in chapter 8. There's another person that's going to do this also in chapter 8. But at the time Daniel receives the vision, there is no temple. So when Daniel sees this, and he's going to explain it in chapter 8, he's going to be amazed that he sees the temple, and then he sees what happens to the temple. And so we're going we're to talk about that too. So go to page two. So now you know the time. So now you know the place uh, of where this is going to happen. Uh, this geographical area, you can read that part two. Now let's go to verse three. The ram with two 
horns, the ram with two horns. Look at verse 3 again. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and, and I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high. One, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up first. Now remember, you should have in your mind these five kingdoms. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the Revived Roman Empire. Always keep those in mind. Now in chapter 7, he explained those kingdoms through four beasts. He's going to explain these kingdoms differently with these rams and goats. So now, who is the ram? Yes. You keep reading came up first. Mine says came up last. Oh. Mine came up last. Mine says, oh, okay. Sometimes it does say came, came up last, which you guys said that too. I don't know why I said came up first. <laughs> but first, that's verse what? Four? Right before four, the last one. Verse three. Yeah, higher one than the other, and the higher one came up last. So, the fourth. The, the first thing we see is that he sees is what? A ram. Now my question to you is, what do you think that this ram represents? Now we're going to talk about these four kingdoms. There's only five five kingdoms that we can talk about. Because the first two have already gone. Nebuchadnezzar is already gone. So now this ram represents, and I put it in the outline, Medes and the Persian kingdom. Now how do we know that? The horns, always remember this, in prophecy, Horns always represents kings or kingdoms. Horns always represent kings or kingdoms in prophecy. And notice what he said in verse 3. One horn was taller than the other. Now, I wrote down here, this is a great chart. This is a great chart that you see on page 2. Um, showing you the ram in verse 8 and what it's going to do all the way through verse 7. You don't have to read that. We're not going to read it. You can read that one at home because on page uh, 3, in verse 3, horns represent kings, rulers, and leaders. I put, I put that there. One horn was longer than the other, which means one will rule longer than the other. So this ram has two horns. One was longer than the other. It represents which one was going to rule longer than the other. The two horns represent Medo-Persia because Medo-Persia was broken up. Uh, it had two parts. Now the Medes ruled first. Some commentators would like to understand it this way. Darius ruled for two years. That's the shorter horn. And uh, the longer horn was the Persians which ruled right after Darius for 20 more years. So it's the Medes and the Persians working together. Some people think that Darius was the first, the little horn, the shorter horn, and that the longer horn was Cyrus. Okay, so that, but it is the Medes and the Persian. Now notice, this chapter starts off talking about the Medes and the Persian. He doesn't even talk about Nebuchadnezzar, does he? He starts off in chapter 8 talking about the Medes and the Persian, meaning what? Nebuchadnezzar in this vision and the Babylonian kingdom has already been destroyed or the Medes or the Persians are the number one kingdom at this point in this vision. So we already talked about uh, the Babylonian period in chapter 7. So now in chapter 8 he starts with this goat with two horns which represents the Medes and the Persians. Okay, And one ruled longer than the other. So now you got that picture in your mind that that's who he's talking about. Now let's look at verse 4. I saw the ram. I saw the ram pushing toward, uh, pushing westward, uh, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver him from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. Stop right there. I told you something that's very amazing about this chapter and about history. In history, now remember, this was written way before the Medes and the Persian came to power, because Daniel is looking into the future. In history, when he says in verse 4, I saw the ram, which represents Medes and the Persian, pushing westward, northward, and southward. Stop right there. Did you know when the Medes and the Persians came to power, they came to power in that order? When those two countries came together and took over, 
the Babylonian period, guess how they did it, and took over the lands in that area. They started westward, then they went northward and southward. That is recorded history. Now, how is it that Daniel can precisely tell you how the military actions happen in that order, and he told it 200 years before? It has to be God. Mm -hmm. So who can argue with you that the Bible or the book of Daniel is not true? Who can argue with you right now anything about the Bible, and he just predicted what the military leaders would do and how they would take over the land. He told you the direction they were even going in. That's how precise God was. When you look into history of the Medes and the Persia, you will find out they started the same direction and in this order the way Daniel predicted it, which means God gave him the vision. Not only did he say that, looking at verse 4 again, he said, you know, uh, westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So once again, the Medes and Persians, they did what? They became great in their own right, the same way that Daniel had prophesied it. And when you look back into history, in the history book, you will find that they were doing this exact same order. So now we see that the Medes and Persia came after who? They came after Babylon. All right? Now look at verse 5. Something happens in verse 5. Because remember, he's looking into the future again. Now we got another kingdom that's about to come up. Let's see what this kingdom is. Look at verse 5. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. Right? And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So this goat had one horn like a unicorn uh, between his eyes. And notice what he said. He said the goat came how? The goat came from the west like it was gliding right across. He, he didn't even walk across or run across. He floated across the ground. Now what I want you to understand there, that's the male goat. This is a representation of the Greece or Greek Empire, which also represents who? Alexander the Great. That horn, because a horn represents leaders and rulers, the horn is Alexander the Great. Now, once again, I always want you to remember we are talking about what? History. Now, we're talking about history from Daniel's perspective. From Daniel's perspective, it's future. From our perspective, it has already happened. So we can see, we can go back into history and see that these things happened. But from Daniel's perspective, when he was telling these things, that was futuristic to him. This was two, three hundred years before it actually happened. And so this goat is a representation of who? This goat is a representation of the Greek Empire. Now watch this. Look at verse 6, because we're going to explain why he was floating. Yeah, let me tell you right now. Why, why was the goat floating across? What do you think that represented? If the goat is the Greece Empire, and he floated from the west quickly, and came and attacked the ram, which we're about to see. Let's read that right quick, and I'll explain what, what the floating meant. Verse 6, here's the goat. Then he came to the ram, and the ram is who? What, what, what kingdom is the ram? Medo-Persian. Medo so here's Greece coming to the Medo Persians. The ram, here's the ram. Then came the, to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen uh, standing beside the river and ran at him with furious power. So guess what? Here comes the goat who does what? Attacks the ram. The goat attacks the ram. Now, when we said that in verse 5 that the goat was gliding across uh, and came without touching the ground. That represents swiftness. And that means the Greece Empire came out of nowhere so fast and attacked the Medo-Persians, they didn't even see it coming. As a matter of fact, uh, Alexander the Great, as you all know, became king of Greece at the age of 21 years old. His father, 
Before he became king, his father was also a great military leader, and he had ruled uh, some places in his in his time, but he had died. Alexander was 21 years old. By the time he was 33, because he died at the age of 33 years old, by the time he was 33, he had taken over half of the world or the world of his day. By the time he was 33 years old, he, he gathered his armies, and the first person they went to, guess what, is the Medes and the Persians. And they came so fast and attacked them. This is human. This is history. If you want to watch the movie Alexander, where what's his name play Alexander the Great? Uh, 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 what's his name's husband? I forgot the blind haired blue eyed guy. I'm trying to remember. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. He played Alexander. That that movie was an historical. Uh, it was historically correct. When you watch the movie, you will see Alexander the Great, even in the movie, taking over all the lands of his time. So if you don't believe it, look back in history and see how they took over the Medes and the Persians. Watch this. If we think that the Medes and Persians were weak, the Medes and the Persians were so fierce and everybody was afraid of them because the Medes and the Persians in their time had a million uh, men army. A million men army. Here come Alexander the Great, wipe them all out. He wipes them all out. So Everybody now is really afraid of Alexander the Great in the time that he has. So when he says in verse 6 that he came to the ram and had, and had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river in the ram, and ran at him with furious power, he attacked him. So now the Medes and the Persians are fighting. Here's another chart I'll show you. You don't have to look at it right now because it talks about the four horns, which we're about to read in a minute. But read those verses at home. Look on page four. Um, as, an opposite, as a result of Alexander the Great's conquest, he destroyed the Eastern influence in Israel and Jerusalem, and he developed a new common form of Greek that is reply, required uh, that he require all people. Remember, this is where we this is why the Bible is written in Greek, because of Alexander the Great. He required all people throughout his realm to adopt as their native language, which is the Greek language. So from this, the Old Testament was retranslated from Hebrew into Koine Greek, and the New Testament books were written in Koine Greek. So that's where we got, that's why we uh, have the Bible in our Greek language today. So the Greek Empire influenced the world, even after Alexander was gone, even after the kingdom was gone, even after the Romans came along, they were still writing in Greek. Jesus spoke three languages, Arabic, Hebrew, and Greek. That's how, that's how influential uh, that kingdom was to the world. So just remember that. He was very powerful. But watch this. The ram goes down. Now we already know who the ram is. The ram is the Medes and Persians. So look at verse 7. And I saw him confronting the ram. This is the goat. And he was moved. That's Alexander the Great. And he was moved with rage against him. Attacked the ram and broke his two horns. First horn representing Darius. Second horn representing Cyrus or the whole kingdom itself. That's what it represents. He attacked them and destroyed them. Now look at verse 8. The broken horn and the four horns. Now something is going to happen to the goat. Remember, chapter 7, I just love the book of Daniel. Chapter 2, the statue. Mm -hmm. Chapter 7, the four beasts. Talking about the same kingdoms. Now we got chapter 8 talking about these kingdoms. Not talking about uh, Babylon, but we, we are real still talking about human history as it happens. Now once again, you can go back into human history and see Alexander the Great, this unicorn, this long horn, defeat uh, Medo-Persia just like Daniel said. And Daniel didn't know anything about Alexander the Great or anybody because this was 300 years before it happened. So I mean, once again, if anybody tried to challenge you about the accuracy of the Bible, and the Bible is just a book that the white man wrote to keep the black man down. <laughs> you know, keep us in slavery. That's what we, we heard a lot. You can tell them, no, that's not true because the Bible has prophesied many things that has already happened before, hundreds of years before they happened. And we can see that he still continues with it. Look at verse 8. Watch this. Here's what happens to the Greek Empire. Therefore, the male goat grew very strong. This is Alexander took over the world. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken. What happened to Alexander the Great at age 33? He died. He is the long horn. That's 
Alexander the Great. Because why is it Alexander the Great? He was the first king who started this Greek empire. So um, that's why I represent him as the large horn. Now what happened? And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Did you know in history that after Alexander the Great died, four generals, because nobody could take over the whole kingdom, they, they were fighting over it, um, they didn't pick one king, they split Alexander's kingdom or the Greek empire into four parts. Four generals took each one, and I wrote it down there in your outline. Look, it says in Daniel 8, Daniel begins to, to, to detail the death of Alexander the Great and the wrestling of control by the four generals over the empire. It is important to also be familiar with the four-way division of Alexander's empire in order to fully grasp all the details that are present. Now, just want to let you know, before we read these four generals, it took over a... Uh, almost uh, 80 to 100 years for them to decide, uh, settle down to say this area belongs to this general. It took a long time. So they didn't just take over after he died. They fought for these positions and tried to take over. So his first general, uh, Cassand uh, Cass Cassander, controlled Greece and uh, Macedonia, uh, Macedonia, uh, Macedonia and Lysimachus controlled, uh, we see Bulgaria and much of the Asia Minor. Seleucus controlled Syria and Mesopotamia. Then came and Anti Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, who hated the Jews. He is a type of expert. Now we're gonna talk about him a lot more. You should underline his name. Underline his name. Antiochus Epiphanes, who hated the Jews type of Antichrist. And then the fourth general is Polyne. What was that? Uh, Polygamy, right? Controlled Libya, Egypt, and Palestine. This is exactly how it happened. So when scripture says four horns replaced the long horn, it happened in, in human history. You can go back in history and find that's why I listed their names. These are real people who rule real lands and these are the four areas of the Greek Empire that lasted almost 200, 300 years. So you know that it is actual history. So Daniel, who saw this happen 300 years before, could, could not have possibly be that detailed if it wasn't true. So we, we know that to be true because we know what history is. Now, what happens in verse 9 is amazing. I want you to remember Antiochus Epiphanes. Let's look at verse 9. And out of one of them came a little horn. Stop right there. In chapter 7, we talked about a little horn. The little horn in chapter 7, listen carefully, is not the same little horn in chapter 8. Just want you to remember that. The little horn in chapter 7 represented who? The Antichrist. You would think that the little horn in chapter 8 represent the Antichrist. But I want you to underline little horn in that verse, and he is a type of Antichrist. And I'm going to tell you who this little horn is right now, is Antiochus Epiphanes. That's who this is, who was one of the, uh, who came after Seleucus, controlled Syria and Mesopotamia, and then came Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, he came after Seleucus, who was the third general. And he ruled Syria and who hated the Jews. He is a type of Antichrist. So in chapter 7, he that's, Daniel was talking about the Antichrist. In chapter 8, he's going to talk about a type of Antichrist. And this is why you have groups of people who don't believe that we're going to go through the tribulation because they believe that the tribulation has already happened because of Antiochus Epiphanes. Because Antiochus Epiphanes, we're going to read what he does to the Jews and what he does to Jerusalem. We're going to read it, and we're going to say, that sounds like the end times. Exactly. So he is a type of Antichrist, but he doesn't do what he does. The Antichrist does on a larger scale and a wider scale. But a lot of people think that we have already passed the tribulation period and that we're really, really living now in the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. And so people have got it all wrong. And I said, well, if we're living in the 1,000-year reign, but we should be living in peace. What are you talking about? 1,000-year reign? We really way off. 
if we're living in the millennial kingdom right now, and we're not, but some people actually believe that we are. So they think that the next thing that's going to happen at the end of the 1,000 year reign, uh, 1,000 kingdom is the eternal kingdom, which is, so their second coming of Christ is really the end of the 1,000 year reign. Our second coming of Christ is at the end of the tribulation period, which the Bible does teach. But we're going to find out why they felt that way, because in chapter 8, He's going to mention a lot of things that the Antichrist or this type of Antichrist does, but a lot of people mix it up because they thought when they read Little Horn in chapter 7, which did talk about the Antichrist, that he's talking about the Antichrist when we said Little Horn in chapter 8. But it is a type of Antichrist. Um, and we're going to keep reading there about that. So watch what he says in verse 9. He says this. He says... And out of one of them came a little horn, this is Antiochus Epiphanes, just to let you know, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. What do you think the glorious land is? Israel. Jerusalem. Yes, yeah, in Israel. So, because uh, he, he has his hatred. So that's verse 9. Look at your outline. In Daniel 8, 8, Daniel observed a little horn growing out uh, among the four horns on the goat. Though this is and similar to the little horn that was revealed in Daniel 7, 8, this little horn is not the Antichrist, but a type of Antichrist. This is the historical figure, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, who was the ruler of Syria from about 175 to 163 BC. There are several differences to note between this little horn and the one that represented the Antichrist in chapter 7. First, the little horn in Daniel 7 was one of the fourth beasts that represents the revived Roman Empire. The little horn in Daniel 8 was on the goat that represented Greece. Second, the little horn in Daniel 7 came up among the ten horns on the beast. The little horn in Daniel 8 came up from among the four horns on the goat. Both little horns are similar and is, and, and is why the little horn on the goat is a type of the one in Daniel 7, which is the real Antichrist. Millennia and time separate the two, which is a thousand years. As well as the extent of their influence, the little horn in Daniel 7 has worldwide influence, whereas the little horn in Daniel 7, or it's supposed to be Daniel 8, has influence only in parts of the Near East. It will be important to remember these distinctions when studying, and we haven't gotten to it yet, Daniel 11, because we're going to run into this again. Uh, so we know, we can turn to the next page, uh, page 5. The following table provides a comparison between the little horn of Daniel 8, which represents Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, with the Antichrist in Revelation, which again is represented by the little horn in Daniel 7. So let's look, see, I, I'm glad he did that with this particular outline. Uh, satanic influence, yes, verse 10. So let's read verse 10 and uh, 11 and 12, and we'll go back to the chart. So verse 10, not verse 10, we're in verse 10, right? We did verse 7. We did verse 9. We did 9. Yeah, so let's do 10, 11, and 12. And it grew up, talking about this uh, little horn which is Antiochus, not the Antichrist in Revelation. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground, and trampled them, verse 11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the hosts, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Then in verse 12, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. So this is Antiochus Epiphanes. This is history already. This has already happened. It's going to happen again. Now what we call this, verse 10 through 12, Revelation called it the abomination of desolation. Now if you remember when we studied the book of Revelation, the abomination of desolation is when is what? What is the abomination of desolation? What does the Antichrist do? They're called, that's called an abomination. He stands on the he stands in the holy place and says he is God himself. 
right? Guess who does that? And this is why some people think that Antiochus Epiphanes was the Antichrist because he did the exact same thing. Remember, you're going to have, uh, Jesus said this. Jesus says in, in the last days you're going to have many false prophets and many false Christ. He said that. So uh, Antiochus was one of them. Uh, Alexander the Great was one of them. You have all these types of Antichrist. And it was John, um, in his Bible we read last week, he said in 2 John that the spirit of the Antichrist has already gone out into the world. So it's been in the world for a long time. You're going to run into leaders. You're going to run into people who are going to uh, claim to be Christ. As a matter of fact, I'm taping a show this Sunday on the History I don't know if it's on the History Channel or not, but there's a show if you ever get a chance to look through your channel to find it. It comes on Sunday night at 10 o'clock about uh, cults and how uh, the people got caught up into a lot of cults. They're going to show the Jim Jones cult, the Heaven Gates ministry. They're going to show all of these cults and how people got sucked up by the leaders. What the leaders did. What, what was so charismatic? What was so attractive about the, these men that they will be sucked into their teaching? So take that or something. I know I'm taking it. It's coming on this Sunday, I think at 9 or 10 o'clock, either on the History Channel um, or, or the Biography Channel. So just look up. It's called uh, uh, Heavens and the Cults or something like that. I'll, I'll look it up and uh, put it on my on the Facebook so you'll see it. I'll put it on everybody know our Facebook is Christian Life Church. So look us, look us up on there and I'll put it on there tonight. Um, what, is, what the name of it is, but I know it comes on Sunday night around 9 or 10 o'clock, but it's going to be a good program. We can talk about that next week. But looking at the chart, since we read verse 10, 11, and 12. Look at this quick review. Satanic influence, chapter 8. That's Antiochus, mm -hmm. chapter, the Antichrist of Revelation, which is the real Antichrist. So, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes had satanic influence. We already know that the Antichrist in Revelation, he's going to have satanic influence. Look at number 2. He magnified himself in verse 11. Antiochus Epiphanes is going to speak great words about himself. And number three, so will the Antichrist, the daily sacrifices is taken away. So guess what? Antioch Antiochus did what? He stopped the sacrifices of the temple. The Antichrist is going to do the exact, exact same thing. Now, looking at the Antichrist and the tribulation, which is only seven years, when is he going to do this? Well, he's going to form a treaty with Israel at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. When does he commit the abomination of desolation? When does he go into the temple and say he's God? In the middle of the tribulation. So after three and a half years of fooling everybody, he shows him true, his true self and he claims to be God, goes into the temple and says he's God. That's the real Antichrist. Well, guess what Antiochus does? He did the exact same thing. Now, he didn't have seven years. Antiochus, we're going to find later how many days he will rule. It, it, it is so precise. It tells you, Daniel's going to tell you exactly how many days Antiochus will rule and torture and persecute the Jews. He tells you the exact days in this chapter. And when you look back in history, it will be those exact days. Yes. So is, is, is this the... Um Yes, because of this part of them interpreting that the little horn in chapter 8 is the Antichrist. So if he is the Antichrist, then the Antichrist already came right. through Antiochus Epiphanes. He was the Antichrist. That's what some people believe. So therefore, we're living in the millennium. <laughs> we have to be. Because Christ must have came, I guess, through the church. So when Christ came, his first coming to them was his only coming. So when he came the first time, he came to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. Well, the church, we already know that's a myth because how long the church been around? Two thousand years. So unless they missed the boat on the first thousand years of Christ, if you want to look at the birth of Christ and go a thousand years, we have already passed two thousand years after the birth of Jesus. So that can't be the millennial kingdom because right now we should be in the eternal kingdom according to them. So evidently, they got it wrong. 
That's why you always stay away from date setters. Stay away from date setters. Anybody that try to tell you, all right, Jesus Christ is coming back in the year 2020 on Rosh Hashanah in September. And then you done sold your house, all your stock and everything, and then Rosh Hashanah passes in September. Well, Jesus, well, you sold your house. Now I got it. So, you know, <laughs> you sold it to me. So, you know, but it, has, it happens every year. It never fails. People get sucked up into Jesus Christ is coming back on this certain, certain day. But Jesus said what? No man knows the day or the hour when he comes. He said, and a lot of people try to trip over it. He says, not even the son knows. But I just want to let you know what that means. When he says not even the son knows, talking about himself, he's talking about his position as a son. Because Jesus is God. Amen. So he already knew. But is, as his position as a son, he did not use his prerogative to tell us anything. He didn't have to. I'm a son. He didn't even tell, he didn't even tell the son as a uh, in, in matter of speak or a figure of, of speech that Jesus was using there. Now watch this. So here, here he is in number five, uh, a set time for the desolation of the temple. He did that. Uh, we haven't read verse 13 and 14, so let's go a little further. But go down to the bottom of page five where it says he will grow and grow and grow, which is verse 10 through 12. Let's listen to some of these things that he would do. This is Antiochus. This is not the Antichrist. These things he did when he was alive. He is a real person. He plundered Jerusalem. He outlawed the Jewish religion and replaced it with Greek worship. He outlawed the observance of the Sabbath. He outlawed circumcision. He outlawed the reading of the scriptures. He burned whatever scriptures he could find. He sacrificed a pig on the altar of the temple. He set up an idol in the temple, an idol of Zeus. He completed uh, he compelled idol worship. It means, means this, he made many Jews worship Zeus in their own temple. He claimed he was God manifest in the flesh. That's just anti Antiochus. What you think that Antichrist, the real one, going to do? He's going to, be, he's going to do what Antiochus did on a what? Wider scale, a worldwide scale. Yes. So he had to have a great, great military following to enforce this. Yes, remember, he took he took over after Seleucus died. He was the leader of the Greek, that third Greek area, so uh, which he ruled. So he took over and then took over the rest. So this only happened in a certain area. But what the Antichrist is going to do, he's going to do on a worldwide scale. Yes. But Antiochus, he only prosecuted Jews, right? But this didn't include Christians, correct? Was it right. only Jews? It was only Jews because remember, this is in his time, which is right. in the still the Greek period time. But they had Christians, um, though, didn't they? Did they have Christians, right? No. No, no, no. no. You know, oh. Christianity starts, you know, oh. so Christianity starts with Christ. Right. But oh, everybody okay. before that, we call, uh, which is just Jewish believers, people have uh, converted to Judaism at that time. But Judaism was still going on at this particular point. Um, uh, one particular writer brought this point out. If you really want to know the history of this time period, uh, you know, we call it the lost books of the Bible. But did you know, we, the reason we call them the lost books of the Bible is because uh, they are not what we call inspired writings. They are more historical writings, some of them. Two that are historical are 1st and 2nd Maccabees, if you ever heard of that. That's one of those one of the two so-called lost books. Those are historical books. And guess what they tell the history of? They tell the history of at the end of Malachi, which is the end of the Old Testament, and before the New Testament. Then it was a 400-year gap between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. 400-year difference. That's the time period we are reading about here. Okay. This is where Antiochus does his damage. And guess what? God raised up uh, some Jewish leaders and they overcame him and they killed him, which we call Hanukkah. This happened on December 25th. So if anybody tried to tell you that December 25th, and they're right, December 25th also represents uh, the, the false religion Sandernalia. It does represent a false cult uh, uh, we call witchcraft and things like that on December 25th called Sandalalia. But it also represents Hanukkah, which is a Jewish uh, festival of how they overcame the persecution of the Jews. God raised up some Jewish men, they, they did a revolt, and they overcame, and they celebrated every December 25th, if you didn't know that. 
But once again, we already know Jesus was not born on December 25th. So we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ on December 25th. There's nothing wrong with that, even though we know he was not born on December 25th. Because you're going to get the Jehovah's Witnesses right. that are going to come to you and say, you're worshiping a false religion and false God because you guys believe that Jesus was born on the 25th. And that's a pagan holiday, Saturnalia, which the, the uh, Witnesses or the Mormons will bring out. And then you can bring out, no, there's another holiday called Hanukkah. And you can bring up this history on it. But that's not why we celebrate. We can celebrate Christ's birth because we want to. Right? And what other day to choose? You can choose any day if you want to, but it's good to choose. I would more so look toward Hanukkah tradition of them, the Jews overcoming this great uh, persecutor of their uh, of their people than looking at Sandinia or, you know, anything like that. But if somebody ever challenges you about uh, the birth of Jesus Christ or celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. There is no scripture that tells us to do it, right? No scripture says, I want you to always remember the birth of Jesus Christ and celebrate it. But there are scriptures that say, you got to remember what? This resurrection. And tell us to celebrate that, which we call Easter. But uh, it's really the resurrection Sunday. So if you celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, you can do it however you want to do it. I don't know if some of you have been watching the news. They've been making this big old argument over the Christmas tree. right? Uh, there was no Christmas tree when Jesus was born. The tradition of the Christmas tree started maybe 150 years ago in England. And, okay, it's a good tradition. It's fine. It's a beautiful tree. It's decoration. You decorate it in your house. But don't lose your faith over it. Don't argue with people whether or not you should put up a Christmas tree or not in your house. If they don't want to put up a Christmas tree, then so be it. If you want to put up a Christmas tree, tell them you like the shining lights and the decoration. That's why you put up the Christmas tree. Because they're going to challenge you. It has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus. Where was the Christmas tree? Well, that's not why I put up the Christmas tree. I don't put up the Christmas tree because of the birth of Christ. I put up the Christmas tree because of the time of the year. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful decoration. And it's just a joyous joyous occasion. It's a tradition that Americans have, what, celebrated for almost 150 years. Yes. I always feel like when Somebody's they say... knocking on the door. But, the front door. But you can tell them, go to, yeah, talk to them. Yeah, go ahead. When they say, they, they say he, it wasn't his birthday, I feel like it's a time when the world has set a date yeah. to celebrate his birth. <laughs> This is a time where that's acknowledged by everyone in the world yeah. to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And if he hadn't been born, he couldn't have died, so that he could be saved. So it's like, I'm going to celebrate his birth as well as his death. because. Yes. So therefore, and then I always look at the Christmas lights and think, God's looking down and saying they lighten up the world for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, however, I, I love the, the time of Christmas, too, because I was explaining it that way, too. Uh, you had other people on commentators on television explaining it this way, those who believed in Christmas and the Christmas tree without even, they said, well, okay, they would tell people who are against Christmas who want to change the Christmas tree to the holiday tree. That's what they want to say. They want to call it the holiday tree, not the Christmas tree. So he said, okay, number one, when you run into people who want to say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas accidents, okay, now where did this holiday start from? Oh, it started with the birth of Christ. So I'm going to keep calling it the Christmas tree. And I'm still keep saying, Merry Christmas. Because, you know, a lot of stores going to put Xmas. They're going to do all that kind of stuff. You are right in your tradition when you say, Merry Christmas. It's all about Christ. Because you got to take them. You got to take, take them back and say, listen, this started with the birth of Christ, as, as our sister stated here. So however somebody try to take away that tradition from you, they can't. Because when you look at it, Jesus Christ is the most influential person that has ever lived. Uh, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, Jesus is the one that split uh, uh, B.C. and A.D. He, he's the one who put, put the split between the two. So Jesus is the one that did that for us. No other man has ever done that. So for somebody to try to tell you you can't have a Christmas tree or don't call it a Christmas tree or try to make you feel bad at work, say happy holidays. Don't say Merry Christmas because you're going to offend somebody if you say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Before you came to this country, it was Merry Christmas. 
So we're going to keep saying Merry Christmas. How do you say Merry Christmas in Arabic? That's how I'm going to tell you. Merry Christmas. But I'm not saying Happy Holidays. I'm not saying uh, the holiday tree. Just to appease you, we have always known that the reason for the season is Jesus. We already know that. So just keep that in mind. So we're looking at uh, what verse are we on? We read what the page six on your outline. And look at verse 13. And this is where we're probably going to close with verse 13 tonight because he's going to talk about a few things. Yes. In verse 13 of Daniel chapter 8. Verse 13. He says this. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision uh, will yeah will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation or the abomination of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? Before I explain that, I want you to go back to verse eleven. No, verse. I think we're about to talk about the stars. So I think that's verse ten. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it came and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground. Stars are always represented, and just wanted to let you know, uh, Israel is represented as stars. Remember we read that in Revelation, that the woman who was uh, on the beast, that she had the 12 star. Remember she was trying to destroy the stars. This is the representation of Israel. So when he says these stars, that Antiochus is trying to destroy are the Jews. So that's what he's talking about. So going back to verse 13, he's asking the question, well, how long is God going to allow all of this to go on? How long is God going to allow the abomination of desolation? Uh, notice what it says, and he gives the answer in verse 14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Stop right there. So how long? Will God allow Antiochus Epiphanes to do what he did? 2,300 days. Let's check history. Did it last? If you divide 2,000 by the years, 2,300 days by years, that's like a little over six years. So he didn't do the whole seven years like the Antichrist would do. But did you know when you go back into history and you look at how long Antiochus persecuted the Jews, it will add up to 2,300 days. That's just amazing. Remember, uh, uh, Daniel was prophesying how many years before all of this stuff happened? Two to 300 years before it happened. So how could he be that detailed without God's help? Amen. Amen. How, how could he be that detailed? We know, yeah, that's good. I saw a vision. That's <laughs> I saw a vision. But you know, I'm just saying because people would love to try to argue with you about the validity of the Bible. They do. They do it all the time. Oh, about you can't trust the Bible. People want to pick and choose what part of Scripture they want to believe in. What part of scripture they want to hold to? Now, I'm going to hold on this thing about this, but uh, I'm going to believe that part about that. No, so you can, if you don't believe none of, some of the Bible, somebody said this, if you believe some of the Bible, you don't believe none of it. Because you need to believe all of it. Because the Bible is the word of God. We're going to stop right there. We're going to we're, we're gonna pick back up um, next week on Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14. And so I want you to, in your books, what page did I say? Read the questions in chapter 8. I think it's page 35 and 36 in your books for the book of Daniel. Remember, write that down. Page 35, 36 is six questions that I want you to answer by next week. And then um, we're going to continue with part 2 of Daniel 8. If you have learned something, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to study your word tonight. Thank you for your love, joy, and peace. Thank you for allowing us to see the future by looking at the past. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that Daniel was obedient and that he wrote down everything that he saw in his vision, the history of Alexander the Great, the history of the Medes and the Persians, the history 
of the Greek Empire. So we thank you, Father, as we learn a lot more in, in, in the time to come about what you have uh, in store for us in the future as born-again believers. Thank you, Lord. As right now, we're going to also prepare for our offering. We thank you for those who are giving tonight. Thank you for those who want to give but do not have. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So Josh is going to... Anybody have questions while Josh is... Do you want to make any comments uh, or questions? Yes. I'm still not real clear about the Medes in Persia. 